Okay, next up, we have the pleasure of welcoming Andrew Shirk from University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. Let's just get you to your... There we are. And then you can escape out. Yeah, yeah. And you can escape out so that you're being demo. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tanya. All right, so by virtue of you all being in this room, I, I don't need to tell you this story. Um, the... I think the thing that uh, is underappreciated, underappreciated is the fact that uh, climate change has not been the main driver of the extinction crisis that we find ourselves in. It's really a legacy of the past several hundred years of land use management, the, the way we made decisions on the ground that have um, led to these, uh, this, these numbers. Um, going forward, though, as the pace of climate change accelerates over the century, uh, I think climate change is going to be a much bigger driver of the extinction rates. And these, these curves might get even steeper and these numbers more dramatic. So I think this could be an underestimate of the, of the magnitude of, of the impacts of climate change. I think it's really the, the intersection between climate change and the expanding human footprint that is, is um, that's gonna play out in some of the worst ways for wildlife um, and biodiversity. So this is just um, a, a projection under certain assumptions of dispersal for mammals, birds, and amphibians done by Josh Lauer's lab at the University of Washington. My point here is that uh, with climate change, many species, many populations are gonna be compelled to move potentially very long distances over short times. And in this modern landscape uh, full of dispersal barriers um, and ur urbanization, highways and such, uh, many species are gonna find it challenging to make these types of movements over the time and, and space constraints that, that are present. And the way conservation is practiced today, it's, it's gonna be challenging to, for the status quo to really meet this challenge. Uh, conservation really isn't uh, organized at a, you know, the spatial and temporal scales um, to, to meet the challenge. So this is a potential range shift for the sagebrush biome in Eastern Washington. And if you think about it, no one land manager owns the full extent of this problem, right? It's, there's hundreds of land managers in this region a few of the bigger ones have conservation plans that are thinking about the problem at this scale, but they're not really talking to each other in any sort of coordinated way. I mean, they mean well, but and, and they have great plans potentially for within their own management areas. But if they don't talk to each other and make their plans line up with their boundaries, then we're not gonna protect a connected network of habitats that can facilitate this, these types of range shifts. So then you end up making local land use decisions that don't have this bigger regional perspective in mind. Uh, and you miss opportunities. Another um, sort of uh, uh, downside of the current status quo is that these it's expensive to make data and models to inform these types of plans, and so they're done rarely and rarely updated, and so they're often, um, these, these plans often become readily out, rapidly outdated. And the discussions of, you know, many of the, of the newer plans have uh, the climate change dimension incorporated into them, but it's done in sort of a, qualitative way often, and it's hard to like make uh, firm decisions on the ground around land use for these, for these things. So in Cascadia, this region of uh, Washington and Southern British Columbia, we've organized uh, as this Cascadia Partner Forum. I wish I had more time to tell you about the Partner Forum. There's a link there at the bottom, cascadiapartnerforum.org. Uh, we're trying to do this uh, conservation differently. We're trying to be more coordinated and dynamic and, and concerned. Uh, practice conservation at larger scales, work together across boundaries. So the first, that this, this uh, partnership formed in 2012, and the first thing we did was not build a tool, right? We have been engaging these folks, these uh, practitioners, these land managers, it's all levels of government from federal to state to local tribes, NGOs, local groups, We've had a dialogue for seven years now, and we've, it's an ongoing process, it never ends, but we have a very good uh, relationship throughout the group, across the group. We have a, a really good understanding of their data needs and the species and biomes that they're willing to work across their boundaries for conservation for. So I feel like that was a, a really important step. And now, uh, just in the last year and a half, we're building a tool that provides, uh, fills the data gaps and provides them information to make land use uh, decisions that can support these, this type of conservation. So this is the, uh, the tool is not finished, it's a work in progress, but this is sort of the scope, the domain of the tool. 
It's to monitor habitat and habitat connectivity for the species and biomes that this audience has articulated that they're willing to work across their boundaries on. It monitors the human footprint over time, uh, both natural and anthropogenic disturbances. And then it projects future uh, rain shifts for species and biomes of interest uh, given climate change scenarios, like, like this sagebrush biome shift you can see in the, in the GIF. And then it maps a connected network of habitats and biomes for each one of these um, targets. And within those networks, it assesses risks and opportunities for improving the functioning of the network. And really the punchline is, is all this information gets distilled down into a single uh, surface that's a blueprint for conservation that we all can, uh, that's, that's sort of the mechanism for coordination uh, in the title there. So if we're all work working off of the same blueprint that spans all of our boundaries, we can make decisions that line up at our borders. And by collectively developing this together, um, it's, it's the blueprint for conservation in the region. The dynamic part comes from Earth Engine and the other uh, Google Cloud tech. Um, this is all, all of the modeling and data ingestion steps are done on a schedule in the cloud um, autom automatically. And they're linked to dynamic data sources. I mean, the Earth Engine uh, catalog is a big part of it, but there's other data sources too, like OpenStreetMaps that this connects to. And the scale part comes from just the scale at which we're practicing, making these relationships and practicing conversation encompasses the full scope of the problem. So we're, we're trying to involve literally all decision makers in these regions. All right, so this is a prototype. Uh, we're just getting ready to try to fly this thing in Cascadia. Um, it's early days. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna try to give you a brief uh, demo of this, but the, I, I wanna make a point here too, is that this is obviously a, a global problem, right? And uh, I, we're building this from the ground up the, uh, in Cascadia so that it can be portable. We can take this, uh, this approach, at least the tool part of the approach, and uh, replicate it in other regions. So we hope to uh, extend our area beyond Cascadia <coughs> soon. Okay, so I escape out of this. Go to the, I don't even see it, Brown. Thank you. Okay. Oh, it's over there. Okay, there we go. Okay, and that's the escape. So I have these. Okay. Let me just go move it. We can go with that, yeah. All right, so. Um, So this region uh, of Cascadia, oh, sorry, doesn't even have a land cover map that spans the border. And so we've been highly constrained by working across our boundaries just from lack of a continuous land cover model. Um, so this tool annually produces new land cover models every year. Um, it uses the great land trender uh, approach in Earth Engine to model forest disturbance across the region. So we can attribute that forest um, disturbances to um, timber harvest or wildfire disease or all sorts of things. Um, and these sorts of disturbances and land cover classes and the open street maps data that it ingests uh, all go into a model of, uh, that quantifies the human footprint in the landscape. And we can attribute this human footprint, it integrates a lot of things, agriculture, energy, infrastructure, uh, population density, transportation, and um, Urban, uh, urban areas. So there's, uh, you can kind of uh, explore the attribution of, of, of the human impact. And then it projects, we haven't done this for, we've only done this for the shrub step biome um, in the region, but I can't get that to scroll. There we go. Um, I'm gonna play an animation of the projected biome shift of the shrub step biome uh, through, this, uh, through the century here. So I don't know if you can see that slider sort of going in. Yeah. Um, so this is the uh, Columbia Basin in eastern Washington, and the, the core of the Columbia Basin is becoming too arid for uh, shrub step. Oh, thanks. The, co the core is becoming too arid for shrub step species, and so this is projecting uh, an upward uh, an elevation expansion of the shrub step biome.
So there's lots of layers in here. Um, the only other one I, I really want to show is um, we can model dispersal out from these uh, areas of suitable shrub step habitat. Takes a second to load. Oh, I didn't pray to the demo god, so maybe it won't <laughs> load. There it goes. So I'm just going to zoom into a little area to, uh, to show you some detail here. <clears throat> I'll go into my Q&A time just a little bit just to, just to finish this. So this is sort of a simulation. It's a stochastic simulation of shrub step species trying to move and track their changing habitat over time um, as it shifts across the landscape. And you can see it you know, slowly every decade uh, shifting across this landscape. And the tool will eventually identify uh, discontinuities, breaks like this uh, Interstate 90 crosses here. And uh, it will identify areas that would improve the functioning of the network if you uh, did uh, conservation, like for, for, a, for a highway, for example, you would want to build a crossing structure. Where would, you, where would you build a crossing structure to get the most bang for your buck? And you can look at like the landscape integrity layer. Um, turn this off. So this looks like a pretty good place to build a crossing structure. So what's actually going on in that area? Um, <coughs> So the landscape, ooh, wow, so we have low landscape integrity. There's uh, a big human footprint here. Um, what are these features in the landscape that might be acting as barriers to migration? Um, if we zoom into the satellite view, uh, we can see Interstate 90, and we can see this highway, and we can see uh, there's actually, if you zoom in even further, we put a wind farm here about five, 10 years ago. And you know, wind, far we, wind farms are great. We need wind farms. Um, but if with this type of information, maybe we could have put it in a, in a place that really didn't um, block a future corridor in the future. So it's this type of on-the-ground action that the tool is really designed to inform. All right, thank you. I think we've got time for one question. So, so the uh, so the Canadian government doesn't have the sort of land cover maps and things that you needed out of the box. They do. They just don't jive at the border, and their their, their land cover classes are a little different. Um, so it's hard to kind of get them to, to match up. And they're and they're not up to date. I mean, even like the USGS in the in the United States. I mean, they just released the 2016 land cover, but wildfire is rewriting the map for for conservation um, of, of species. The lynx folks in Washington, uh, we've had wildfires the last three years that have completely changed the map for conservation for that species. So we need, the point of this is to make it more frequent um, updates, annual updates, so that we can uh, not just update the inputs into the models, but update the conservation plan itself every year so that it stays uh, dynamic and adapts to change. Thanks. Cool, thank you very much, Andrew.